great we have recording so we can start hello everyone welcome today for the eden event uh, my name is sandra kuchin i'm i'm eden vice president and i'm going to moderate uh, this session today um today we start with uh, one more open education week and i'm happy to announce that Eden is joining this very important global initiative this year as well. And uh, as Eden is strongly supporting open education and its impact on teaching and learning worldwide, we have joined this initiative in order to share experience and know-how in open education from the point of uh, foresight to uh, policies, to open universities, to research in education, and the good initiatives and practices. Today, uh, our webinar uh, uh, starts uh, with the topic Education 2030. But just before we start with this session, let me uh, uh, share, we share with you the other events we are going to have during this week. So tomorrow, the story of Open University in Europe and the world uh, it will be definitely a very interesting uh, session with uh, people coming from open universities sharing their um, uh, opinion and uh, reflection on how uh, should open universities work today and how much they have been changed since uh, their start. On Wednesday, a very important topic on ongoing initiatives for open education in Europe. Uh, please uh, uh, share, share, uh, 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 join this session and listen to very uh, interesting uh, topics and projects which are ongoing now re relating to the open education. On Thursday, uh, OER quality assessment, a uh, highly uh, uh, important topic uh, prepared by our Eden Net. Uh, which is uh, discussing uh, the issues on uh, importance of quality uh, assessment in open uh, education. And on Friday, uh, researching openness, evidence-based approach. We are talking about uh, openness from the research perspective, how much openness contributes uh, to the education today. So please join our Vice uh, President for Research, Joseph Duarte, uh, on Friday and discuss uh, the issue, how can research uh, uh, help in uh, um, achieving better open education. So uh, I'm sure that uh, all topics are very interesting. All our webinars, as you can see, start at uh, 1 uh, p.m. CET uh, in, the same, in the same room. So for today, uh, I'm just going to, to warn you again to, to make you aware that all our recordings are, uh, sessions are recorded and recordings will be available at our Eden uh, web page. And um, I'm very happy that we start with very important session, Education 2030, Open Knowledge, Skills, Attitudes and Values in Europe and the, the World. Uh, as you can know, we cannot only think about past and today, we have to predict the future. Today, it's not very easy to predict what's going to be in future, as changes are happening quite uh, uh, often and quite frequently. Uh, so um, today, I have with me distinguished speakers who will uh, share their views and ideas on this topic. So. Um, First is Irina Volungevciene, Eden President from Vitatus Magnus University in Lithuania. Uh, then Morten Flate Paulsen, Eden Senior Fellow and former Eden President, now Acting Secretary General from ICDE. Uh, Svetlana Knyazeva, Eden Fellow and from UNESCO Information Technology in Education uh, Institute in Moscow. Katrin Bardoel from NUFIC, and Paul Bacic from uh, Matic Media, LTD, and Zero Consulting. So um, why we have chosen this topic? Uh, recently, uh, European Commission, Commission had a forum on future on e-learning in Brussels last 
not last month, but uh, uh, by the end of the January, um, trying to set uh, priorities uh, and uh, see what strategic uh, actions should be done in the next decade. Uh, taking the part of open education, we decided today to present some of the ideas and some of the uh, important topics uh, what should happen with open education in the next 10 years. So um, I'm happy now to give the floor to Eden, Eden President, um, my dear colleague Irina, who has been done so much, who's been doing so much, the first um, as the Director of Innovative Studies Institute at Vitaktus Magnus University, but as an Eden President she has achieved that Eden uh, strongly um, represent and support the open education uh, and all the issues related to the education, and not only today, but the education of tomorrow. Her topic is what does it mean to be open in education, lessons learned and challenges raised. And please, Irina, share with, you, share with us your views on uh, open education. Thank you very much, Sandra, dear colleagues. Uh, very nice to see here uh, old and new friends and people who care about uh, the open education and work uh, towards uh, empowering higher education institutions, uh, learners in any level and sector of education to reach out for knowledge, for information, for uh, new forms and formats of skill development. I will speak uh, on behalf of Eden European Distance and E-Learning Network uh, to provide to you quite short summary due to the limited time frames that we have here today for this panel. Uh, to look uh, through the perspective what Eden observes in the development of open, opening up education in Europe, what does it mean to open up education, and also what lessons and uh, challenges have been recorded and can be brought forward as a summary from the perspective of Eden. So definitely one of the most significant initiatives taken in the last decade was the opening up communication by the European Commission that established the preconditions and supported not only the European education policy, but supported initiatives taken by organizations in uh, uh, initiating, explaining, training, and supporting different forms of the openness in education. Open has always been in the legislation, I would say, of European Distance and E-Learning Network because we have the focus on openness since the development uh, of the network for two decades and even more in the definition of open and distance learning. And uh, recently, we can say that European developments can be proud of the openness as a tool for, quali for quality assurance as well as for the transparency in education. Openness became the strength of European institutions, recognizing uh, transparent, collaborative tools for networking, for collaboration, for teamwork uh, through multidisciplinary areas and multilateral agreements of education organizations. Open professional collaboration came on the stage, we would say, in recent decades. And uh, it brought very interesting and innovative formats of collaboration, including virtual multilateral mobility types of teachers and students in higher education, new learning and teaching schemes, new pedagogies, new didactics, and new types of assessment. 
openness brought many challenges, but definitely uh, we already recognize today that we have initiatives to be followed with other uh, scenarios in open pedagogies and open learning offers. Of course, research comes not always at hand, but we do our best to make good links and synergies between professionals, professionals, academics, and researchers in order to address the degrees and forms of openness. Many initiatives that have been on the stage of, your, of European policy recently uh, still need deeper investigation what openness means for education, what are degrees and what are the forms that we recognize and that we agree upon. Recognition and certification also received specifically a new uh, form and uh, received new attention towards its development when uh, uh, open uh, education evolved in uh, the form that it needs new uh, credentials, digital and open credentials, new um, descriptions of valid open and online learning formats, of open and online learning environments and solutions. There's a lot to do. And these are all the forms that we identify as the forms of opening up education but at the same time the challenges that we need to address. Open science and open access are also on the agenda of Digital Education Action Plan in Europe. Eden is a member in um, a working group uh, targeted at open coordination and open consultation of um, stakeholders involved from all member states in the European Union, including uh, such organizations as EDEN, Delta meaning for Digital Education, Learning, Teaching and Assessment. And here also we identify at least two very <laughs> evidently highlighted topics uh, for the second mandate of this working group, namely fostering transparency, quality assurance, validation and recognition of skills and qualifications through digital, online and open learning formal, non-formal and informal formats. And the second one, boosting availability and quality of open and digital educational resources and pedagogies. We think uh, everywhere, in, in every context that we uh, meet our colleagues and also experts uh, and policymakers, that only exchange of open educational practices, topics and peer learning might be the best uh, tools in order to clarify, uh, analyze, and uh, support the development, incubate, and experiment uh, with the innovations in these topics. Even contributions are really numerous. Uh, the whole community behind our member organizations, and I would call future member organizations and through consortia, are involved in research, experimentation, and piloting of openness. But uh, the recent uh, references that I would like to make are, of course, the statements from Eden Research Workshop, uh, the 10th research workshop that took place in Oak, uh, Universidad Aberta de Catalunya in Barcelona, in autumn 2018, where four statements were identified for further research that support personalized guidance and support for learning. One out of four, which is statement number three, as you see in the slide, uh, refers to open education that goes beyond the production and use of OER, but is linked to distributed and network structure of knowledge in the digital age, as well as collaborative, flexible, sharing nature of social network environments as potential learning context. We celebrate uh, Open Education Week in Europe since 2017 
and uh, uh, organize events. And last year, in 2018, in March, we discussed the topics that were brought by our community members as highlight topics. And I identified three of them here in the slides. Challenges for the quality of OER, that you will see is linked to this year's topic as well. Grassroots of Open Educators at Work and discussion on how to promote academic integrity in online education. All of these were closely related and addressed really uh, important, specific challenges uh, that educators and researchers and experts need when they discuss the formats of open education. European Distance Learning Week also recognizes the topic of openness among the topics that evolved during distance learning week agenda. So uh, you can see them here, uh, mainstream of education in Europe towards much more flexible, accessible and equitable mode. Openness as tribute to quality of teaching and learning, again repeated as the reference from my first slide, and then impact for communication. This year we also selected, as you already saw, Sandra introduced the topics that come from both bottom-up and top-down approach, where grassroots initiatives and policy initiatives meet and try to identify the common language, uh, common challenges to be solved together hand-in-hand hand, through collaboration. But the new focus uh, this year uh, can, was identified, which is a strong emphasis on researching openness and evidence-based approach. So this will be the event on Friday that Sandra already introduced. Therefore, uh, I just support the, that we start with today's panel introducing our uh, key and urgent topics uh, from thematic analysis and topic analysis on the openness in Europe and then continue with further focused approach discussions during the week. So thank you for the opportunity to introduce uh, Eden perspective towards researching and practicing and experimentation of openness and uh, I now would like to give the floor to the next panel speaker. Irina, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just before we, we go further, um, as even president and as a, as a scientist and a researcher, what would be your priority? What would you choose as a priority uh, for, for open education uh, in, in the next decade from your perspective and this broad overview you, you have? Uh, as a researcher, I uh, would follow, first of all, uh, the discussion and debate on the questions that you can see now in the slide. But research, in my perspective, should always be applicable. So at the same time, I would give priority for open professional collaboration of academics, of teachers and students students as well, but teachers should be prepared first, in terms that we facilitate and collaborate and create together open collaborative spaces in any form, not only virtual mobility, but also other formats, peer reviewing, uh, uh, support schemes, when we can collaborate, when we can teach together, when we can share openly our practices and improve them at the same time. So this would be my priorities. Thank you, Irina. Yes, very important issue. And this is why Eden is here to support such collaboration and networking in order to share experience and, and know-how and to collaborate. Thank you. Um, when we talk about uh, open education, also important issue is leadership. So um, now we are moving to our next speaker. Morten, um, who is also, I said, who is, our, as I said, uh, former Eden president, but now acting secretary general of um, uh, ICDE. 
International Council for Open and Distance Education. He's also CEO of Nording Open Online Academy. And also uh, he has be, been in field of e-learning and uh, online education for really number, number of years. Uh, so what uh, is open leadership and uh, mapping and tra tracking global initiatives? Martin, please, floor is yours. Share with us. Thank you, Sandra. Do you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Sandra said, I am uh, now working as active, Acting Secretary General of the International Council of Open and Distance Education. Uh, it is a really global uh, organization with uh, 200 institutional members uh, on all continents. And uh, our estimates is that these institutions altogether have 15 million students. And uh, the institutions are mainly coming from three categories. It's the traditional open universities that are really huge institutions. Uh, we have blended uh, institutions, dual mode uh, institutions that a focus on distance education and online education. And finally, we have a number of institutions that provide services to online students and institutions. We also have uh, an increasing number of individual members, uh, and we are open to uh, accept more individual members. Uh, as Sandra started to say, it is really difficult to predict uh, what is going to happen in the next decade. And uh, it's also especially difficult uh, if you have a global focus, because there are differences between the continents. Uh, so since I just have 10 minutes uh, as a presentation here, I have decided to focus on just three uh, strands of, of thoughts. The first is the ICDE strategy that is uh, that we are working after today, but also have started for the next strategy period to discuss. Uh, I will also uh, share some of the recent reports that we have been working on, and I will also talk a little bit about uh, roadmaps initiatives that we have initiated to predict uh, the future for institutions and, and uh, uh, organizations. But first of all, uh, we are working with three-year strategies at ICDE. And uh, I have just started working with a group of people to start developing the strategy for the next three years. And um, both in the existing strategy and in the upcoming strategy, I guess the four bullet points that you can see on this uh, transparency is uh, the focus trends that we have identified are and are discussing. We obviously see some sort of globalization or internationalization that is an important trend for us. Uh, we obviously see uh, that technology is still very important. Open educational resources, alternative digital credentials, uh, big data, and things like that are important trends that we work with and look into. We obviously still see some uh, important demography issues. Uh, migration is part of that, of course. And we are also uh, interested in the sustainability of uh, openness. Uh, who is going to pay for it? Uh, how can we make this sustainable uh, and uh, available for people when the funding is not there 
and such kind of issues. So these are important uh, overall trends that uh, we see and discuss at the moment. And uh, of course, this is on a very uh, uh, top level uh, part of the strategy. But these are trends that we find uh, important. Uh, based on some of these strategies, we are developing and publishing on our website uh, a number of reports that have been written by groups of people that are in our network and among our members. Uh, these are four recent and upcoming reports that kind of, of indicate what we think is important. We have Develop, published a, a report on models for online open and flex, flexible and technology enhanced higher education across the globe. We have uh, published a report on alternative digital credentials in which open, ba open uh, badges and uh, blockchains is a part of it. We are uh, probably next week um, publishing a global guidelines for ethics in learning analytics. And uh, later this year, we will uh, re publish a report on global quality. So these are important issues that we think uh, is important for our members today and for the future. Uh, Together with um, the Open Educational Consortium, we have uh, focused on uh, developing a roadmap toolkit for uh, leaders and institutions and uh, uh, whoever who would like to develop a roadmap for the future for their work. And uh, this was introduced uh, in our conference in Paris in December, and uh, there were a lot of, of uh, leaders in our field that worked out these roadmaps uh, for their uh, needs and interests. And we took this uh, roadmap also to our recent uh, ICD conference in Lillehammer, Norway, where uh, Three hundred and fifty people from around the globe uh, convened, and there all speakers and participants at the conference were invited to contribute to what we call the Lillehammer Lifelong Learning Roadmap. And uh, this is quite recent, and it's still uh, uh, work uh, under development. But I have chosen to share some of the draft uh, results from that uh, work with you. And first of all, uh, we came up with five um, issues or recommendations that we, as a conference, uh, thought should be of importance for governments and intergovernment organizations. The first one is that they should focus on sustainability. Uh, the second one is that they should in, uh, increase incentives for lifelong learning. The third one, establish a system for cooperation between employees, public organizations, and educational institutions. Four, promote regional and global partnerships. And five, focus on developing the human capabilities needed to thrive in a carbon neutral digital age. So that was uh, some of the issues that came out of the conference. And I emphasize that this is still a draft and we have invited all participants to come back with the updates on this in some sort of a Delphi technique. Uh, the second uh, 
set of recommendations was uh, towards the educational sector and public-private enterprises. They should um, innovate collaboratively. They should provide seamless pathways between formal and non-formal learning. They should establish financially viable continued education. They should use technologies that are relevant and affordable for all. Five, promote accessible lifelong learning that can be applied across languages and cultures. And finally, acknowledge and recognize different accreditation systems. And the, the, the final set of uh, statements goes toward the educators. And they should ensure that learners feel that their skills and their knowledge are useful. It was recommended that they should apply distance online education with blended approaches. Uh, three, integrate vulnerable groups as part of the lifelong process. And four, encourage learners to become self-motivated to develop their knowledge and soft skills. And five, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and interactions. And, and I emphasize that these are uh, sent out to all participants at the conference. And we are now collecting uh, feedback on these so that we will come up with a final version of this later from the conference. I should say that uh, a lot of, of good people from all around the world uh, attended and have contributed to this. And uh, I guess that this is one chance for me also to get some feedback from you if you think these are important issues that we should uh, take further in this process. And I guess that's what I have time to, to say during this very short uh, introduction, and I hope to get some feedback and questions related to this later on uh, during the session. So thank you, and uh, we'll talk thank more you. later in the discussion. Uh, very, very uh, interesting presentation, and I, I certainly like the, the draft uh, you presented. Um, maybe, as you were mentioning uh, in your presentation, sustainability is an important issue. Uh, just your comment, how to ensure sustainability in openness? I think it's quite a challenge, especially when we're talking about financial issues, but there are also other issues except uh, financial. What would be your comment about sustainability, to ensure in sustainability in open education? Well, that is a very important, crucial question. Uh, and uh, from my personal experience, I think that we all should focus on cost effectiveness because someone somewhere has to pay for uh, services and content that we offer. Even when it's open, someone has to pay for it. And I guess that we as individuals, as well as the organizations we work with and the nations we represent should focus on how to get most learning from the money. And uh, I'm very sure that when we look around there is a lot of money spent on education which is probably not the way best way of spending it. So I would personally encourage everyone as individuals, institutions and nations to think about how we best can spend the money we have to get as much learning from the money as we can. Thank you. I agree with you. Um, let's move further to the, our next speaker, Svetlana Knyazeva from uh, UNESCO IET who is going to talk about open education and urgent need for recognized 
I think OER-based learning outcomes in Europe and worldwide, definitely issue also related to the financial part uh, regarding uh, the financing, what has been done, and also to ensure that learners feel uh, that their learning is useful. So, um, Svetlana, uh, what would be uh, your presentation? Uh, please, floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Sandra. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So it's a pleasure to join the uh, even webinar within this Open Education Week, and uh, well, you will see that uh, well, probably the issue of recognition of OER-based learning outcomes is very um, urgent now because Irina mentioned it, Morten mentioned it and the next presentation will be also related uh, to this and I could see that in chat uh, you Sandra uh, well, asked the participants what would be the most important uh, issue and uh, the, well, the, one of the answers is certification. So, uh, well, um, I know that many of you are um, advocates of uh, open educational resources and experts in um, uh, advocates of open education and experts in open educational resources. But for those participants, uh, well, who joined us from universities, etc., I just would like to. Uh, refresh the definition of open educational resources, which are teaching and learning materials that reside in the public domain or are released uh, under an open license uh, that um, allows uh, no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution with no or limited restrictions. And I will also speak about. Uh, MOOCs, uh, which are well, uh, not fully, uh, well, let's say they are conventionally free and conventionally open, but still MOOCs are digital online courses uh, accessible at special platforms. Uh, so this is uh, well, uh, already established trend. And uh, um, while speaking about education 2030, uh, well, it is uh, generally recognized that uh, OER can and shall uh, support the Sustainable Development Goal 4, ensure equal, equal opportunity and access to education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Uh, through its ta uh, target uh, 4.3, ensuring expanded and uh, equitable access to all forms of post-basic education and training. However, um, our um, recent studies, uh, well, they uh, confirmed that uh, despite many efforts made to promote OER, uh, their use, uh, they still remain uh, on the margins of uh, educational systems. Uh, the Horizon Report 2015 postula postulated the proliferation of o OER as a key trend, uh, accelerating technology adoption in higher education, but the Horizon Report 2017 stated that, uh, well, there is a problem with uh, uh, there are significant issues with access and equity. Uh, uh, so uh, our experience and evidence proves that this is not only access and equity, this is also motivation and uh, I'll, if we wish, uh, well, certainly in certain regions people need access uh, to educational materials because there is lack of uh, paper texts, books, etc. And uh, in this region, access is an issue. But in uh, other uh, cases, uh, well, often open educational resources are used only as uh, a kind of supplementary um, materials to existing official textbooks. 
So uh, we all know the four arc of open content uh, that we are formulated in 2007 by David Wiley. These are reuse, rework, remix and redistribute. And in 2014 he revised this framework and mentioned also a very important uh, uh, issue related to authorship. Uh, and this is retain the right to make, own and control copies of the content. So uh, I will raise uh, the issue of the need for the six, six R uh, of open content and uh, this is uh, mainly maybe not for the uh, users and uh, mm, producers and users of OER, but this is rather for uh, policy makers, institutional, national, etc. So this is recognition of learning outcomes um, based on open educational resources. And the, there were several uh, projects aimed at uh, testing the recognition of OER-based learning in formal settings. For example, uh, the OER test project in 2011-2012 for four universities. In our studies, um, uh, futures of ICT in higher education, we also asked the respondents, uh, are national systems of recognition of learning outcomes and credentialing prepared to accommodate the results? of open education and the answer was um, that uh, recognition of OER MOOC based learning results is an important aspect of incorporation of open content in the educational process. Um, and though currently many HEI are at a very early stage of recognition of OER MOOC based learning results, um, they, are, they have already started experimenting with uh, micro uh, certification, uh, certificates, badges, etc. And it is expected that within the uh, 15 years from now, the existing system of awarding credits will change and uh, the credits for AR and MOOC uh, would be increasingly accepted. I checked the report that uh, uh, Morten uh, mentioned in his presentation and I could see there the list of 27 universities that are experimenting with uh, this kind of uh, recognition. They are mainly from USA, Australia, UK, Several are from uh, Latin America, Spain and Italy, but still uh, this is uh, an emerging trend, I would say. Mm. As to the studies, uh, uh, European Commission is quite active in investigating the issues related uh, to validation of non-formal MOOC-based learning assessment recognition metrics uh, uh, going open and uh, uh, so these three publications are by Joint Research Center based in Sydney and uh, there is also the Center for, one moment, uh, European Center for the Development of Vocational Training. Uh, so they are also in 2016 they produced a report uh, on validation of open educational resources and uh, actually I would say that the conclusions that are made uh, uh, by uh, well these two bodies, uh, these two research agencies of the European Commission are well mm, very similar. So uh, CD4 they have a formulation for uh, uh, OER soft recognition uh, arrangements and their re recommendations for validation of OER based learning include share knowledge and spread good uh, practice on the validation of OER derived learning across the formal education center, expand the, uh, the um, options of what can be validated to include full qualifications. 
uh, develop and make uh, uh, stakeholders aware of the options for validation of learning outcomes. Improve measures to link learning derived from the use of OER with other uh, generic systems. Invest in high quality assessment systems. And uh, GRC uh, recommendations well, uh, are uh, provides the legal framework for schools and universities to take the necessary steps towards recognition of open educational resources and open educational practices. Provide the legal frameworks for open learning to be formally recognized uh, at um, all levels of formal education. Ministries should support digital science certificates, digital credentials and uh, badges, exploring mm, new ways to verify and store credentials, uh, promote the formal recognition of time spent or spent on creating and engaging with open education activities. Uh, well, I fully agree with uh, those uh, recommendations and unfortunately I couldn't find uh, in the um, OER action plan produced after the second OER uh, symposium, Congress, uh, I didn't find uh, mentioning of uh, this kind of uh, uh, measures that I believe are absolutely uh, necessary. So there should be uh, arrangements both at legal, political and institutional levels that would make uh, recognition of OER-based results possible. Thank you. Svetlana, very, very good overview of policies that is uh, that are done by European Commission and uh, the, the, they are, up, they are um, willing less to, to give some recommendation to the to the countries, EU countries, how to proceed with uh, implementation of OER. Uh, based on your so far uh, overview and knowledge, what do you think, how important do uh, countries find this uh, recommendation and uh, do they uh, take them seriously? Uh, well, this, this uh, well depends on a country because we can see that uh, uh, different countries are at a very uh, different uh, stages of promotion of open educational resources and all issues the, that are uh, related to this phenomenon. Um, I would say that uh, first there should be a policy or strategy at the national level. Then, mm, well, uh, they should go down to the institutional level. But, uh, well, anyway, um, any strategy or policy, uh, uh, well, they don't, they don't work if uh, there, there are no funding mechanisms that would uh, support these activities, etc. So this should be a complex of activities at political, financial, educational, pedagogical, um, assessment, etc. So this is a complex, but uh, uh, well, as you see from today's presentations, from the uh, the chat, from the next presentation, I hope you will see the same. The the issue of uh, recognition of uh, OER um, based learning outcomes is it becomes a very urgent issue. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you. We have started talking about uh, recognition and certification. So our next topic is also talking about effective policies for recognition of new forms of online learning. And uh, with us is Katrin Bardel from NUFIC. NUFIC is Dutch Organization for Internationalization in Education, if I have said it uh, uh, quite well. Uh, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, this is a project you are going to present so, uh, what are the uh, our goals and outcomes of this project? So, please, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, 
Yes, NAFTEC is indeed the Dutch Organization for Internationalization of Education, and we serve the whole education sector in the Netherlands with all kinds of activities um, and programs. And um, I work uh, as policy officer at the uh, International Recognition Department, and um, this is also the Dutch um, uh, uh, National Academic Recognition and Information Center, or the NARIC Center. And um, as such, as the NARIC Center, we co coordinate a, a European project, which is called Evaluate, in which we collaborate with other European uh, recognition centers to uh, improve recognition of e-learning. And I will uh, give you a short presentation of our uh, project, of the Evaluate project, and also of the project that came before the Evaluate project, which is called Paradigms. Um, yeah, first of all, we are uh, getting MOOC certificates occasionally. I have to say it's, it's still the big talk of our work at the, as, at, the, at the recognition department is really um, a recognition and assessment evaluation of um, uh, uh, degree, degree qualifications, but sometimes MOOC certificates are also included in a, in a file. So this is sporadically uh, um, coming to our desk, and of course we are we have started this this project to because we we know that in the future there will be much more of this. Um, uh, so what is happening? We are looking at uh, digitization as a, as a catalyst of, uh, for flexible education. Um, it is possible now, instead of doing a coherent study program to, for students to pick and choose their own MOOCs and collect certificates and badges to, to develop their own uh, study program. Um, another way of, of uh, education becoming more flexible is that uh, MOOCs or e-learning is offered also by providers outside of higher, a formal higher education. Um, so it's not only the accredited institutions anymore that are offering education, but uh, also other, uh, like the Linda platform from, from LinkedIn, where you can follow courses in leadership development, for instance. And then we see the unbundling of content development assessment and certification where um, Students may be able to follow a MOOC um, from one institution and then be tested by another uh, institution. So those uh, three, uh, head teaching, developing uh, a study program, and uh, assessment and certification that is traditionally done by one and the same institution can now be done by multiple actors. So of course, um, oh, where's my arrow? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm working on two screens and sometimes, <laughs> yeah, there it is. So of course this is good because it supports uh, lifelong learning and it, it is also uh, expected to, to, to improve inclusion of, uh, of groups that traditionally do not have access to higher education, for instance, uh, refugees or migrants, to improve their, their, the accessibility of higher education for these groups. But there are also consequences for recognition, um, because as recognition professionals, we uh, we we usually well we are used to looking at formal qualifications, and we're used to dealing with that. But these like online badges and uh, uh, certificates are really something new that also need another perspective from recognition professionals. So in order to to develop Common, a common guide, guidance and, and support for recognition professionals. We started the new paradigms and recognition project in 2016, together with uh, other experts from from the Enigmatic Networks. And we published a uh, in 2018. We uh, published a position paper or policy paper called "Oops, a MOOC." And uh, this position paper, we um, we have. Distinguish three. We started with distinguishing three scenarios scenarios for the evaluation of MOOCs. So first, there's MOOCs as part of a degree program. Uh, for instance, in in the form of open education or or in the form of uh, blended learning. Then there's a, a possibility for students to to make a collection of MOOC certificates. 
instead of a coherent study program. And the last option is to have to get a file that includes a MOOC certificate in addition to a traditional qualification. So when we get a MOOC certificate as part of a degree program, for us, it is not a problem. In general, if it is part of a uh, of an accredited degree program, we we do not look at the separate MOOCs, and if parts of it are offered, or if even if the whole program is over, offered online, this should not be a problem for recognition. The second one, a collection of MOOCs certificates as separate modules, is more problematic because um, then you would have to establish if this collection of MOOCs or credits is comparable to a to a, a degree program and has the same depth and uh, uh, it has the same depth and the same uh, uh, covers the same uh, uh, in terms of content is comparable to a degree program and that is very difficult to to establish and then, and it would be certainly be very time in, intensive so for us as NERC, in NERIC centers that is not possible at the moment and then the third option of uh, getting a receiving a MOOC certificate um, in addition to a traditional qualification is actually what we see at the moment most most of the time and uh, is also um, uh, something we, we can deal with in a very practical man manner especially if the MOOC certificate um, adds learning outcomes uh, to the traditional qualifications that um, yeah, that may otherwise, uh, uh, in case of deficiencies. So, when the traditional quali qualification, uh, there are deficient deficiency for access to the uh, to the to a study program, um, the MOOC may be able to to resolve those deficiencies. So, next to. Uh, uh, these three scenarios, we uh, 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 developed criteria for the evaluation of MOOCs. So what do you actually um, look at? What do you, do you check when you get a MOOC certificate on your desk? And these criteria are to a large extent based on the criteria we use, we use for formal education with some additional criteria included as well. So first of all, there's the quality of the study program. Um, there's the level of the study program, the learning outcomes, the workload, uh, verification of the certificate. So, do you know if it's uh, if it's authentic? Um, the way study, and then that is actually also something we look at in formal qualifications. And then uh, the additional ones are um, the way study results are tested. So, has there been any testing? Has there been any online proctoring? How how do we know that the uh, results have actually been obtained? And the seventh one is identification of the partic partic participant, which is, of course, also very important for online learning because, um, yeah, you have to know if the person giving the certificate is, is also the one who has been uh, doing the online course. Um, whereas uh, for formal qualifications, we have uh, the Bologna tools that, are, that, that we can use to um, uh, certify if those criteria are met. In, uh, 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 for MOOCs or for online learning, this is often much more pro problematic. So for quality, we have, of course, the uh, quality assurance mechanisms. Um, if, if an uh, institution is accredited, then um, this is for, 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 for recognition purposes, we, can, we trust that, is, that, is, that the quality standards are, uh, are OK. So there's no extra check that we have to do. But for e-learning, for, for standalone, for MOOCs, for instance, this is often lacking. lacking. They are often not part of the quality assurance framework. So then quality becomes much more problematic. And we have to look at other things. For instance, is a MOOC accepted for admission to a study program at, a, at an accredited institution? If yes, that would be a quality indicator. But it's much more difficult to, to, to know. The same goes for a level. We have the national qualification frameworks uh, linked to the U European quality frameworks, but um, those references are not often made made on MOOC certificates. 
And this, um, uh, the t diploma supplement is, of, is of course, uh, something available and very often used uh, for, for formal qualifications. Um, to describe the learning outcomes, well, learning outcomes for MOOCs, for online uh, courses, are often quite well framed and formulated, but once a course is no, no longer there or once the, the content of the course changes, the learning outcomes, the description changes, and it's difficult to know if it's still up to date or, or if, it's, uh, if it matches with the certificate that we have received. And then the last one, the workload. Uh, of course, the ECTS are a very useful uh, uh, tool developed within the Bologna framework to know uh, the workload, but also their uh, higher in education institutions often don't make use of ECTS when when uh, when giving out a MOOC certificate, for instance. So, um, based on those seven criteria, we we started the test the test phase. We uh, collected some MOOC certificates and uh, gave them to the recognition professionals. Um, to make an assessment, and um, the outcomes of the test were that uh, the people were able to find, find most of, rele of the relevant information, but it took them a very long time because there is no standard um, uh, information available as it is in, in formal qualifications. So it's often very difficult to look for the relevant information. Um, but they were, however, quite flexible in, in um, awarding um, green lights in, 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 in accepting um, uh, certificates. Um, and another uh, outcome of the test phase was also that was already mentioned by uh, Svetlana, I think, that the legal mandate does not always permit evaluation of MOOCs and, and online courses. So from the Paradigms project, we had uh, two uh, main recommendations. The first one is that it is important to balance the added value of assessing a MOOC against the time needed. So sometimes a MOOC, an, a MOOC certificate is only a certificate of someone who has been watching uh, a video, for instance. Um, but sometimes it also has substantial volume and, and it can be uh, relevant to take away deficiencies and to be able for, for a person to be uh, admitted or to to get exemptions in a in a in a uh, formal study program, so it's always important to balance that um, the time needed against uh, uh, the, the added value. And then the second recommendation um, is to create uh, more transparency on e-learning and on e-learning providers that are trustworthy and of high quality. Because if we can do that, if we can create that transparency, it will also make it's much easier for uh, recognition professionals to, to assess um, certificates. So after uh, concluding the Paradigms project in 2018, we started the Evaluate project, which is actually um, uh, where we uh, continue with the rec recommendations of the Paradigms project. This time, we are not only working with the Enoch Narek centers, we have only Oh, we've also invited higher education in institutions to join and to bring in their uh, perspectives. And we are uh, now focusing not only on MOOCs, as we did in the previous one, but it's a bit broader. Uh, uh, we now call it standalone e-learning. Um, so um, there are two... Uh, Main outcomes are foreseen. We are we, the project will end in 2020, so we're still uh, working on uh, on it. But the first is to develop an online learning information tool, which is aimed at professionals in academic recognition and and uh, gives them more information on uh, trustworthy uh, providers um, uh, and with, with lots of examples of how you can assess and look at MOOCs uh, uh, or e-learning certificates. So it should help them to make an informed recognition decision in uh, within reasonable time li limits. And the second outcome is a position paper, which is not aimed at the uh, recognition professionals, but is aimed at e-learning providers. So anyone at higher education institutions or elsewhere involved in development of, of uh, online learning to um, 
bring in the perspective from academic recognition. So what is it that you should think about if you want your course to be recogni recognized um, uh, for further study? We have uh, uh, the, both, both uh, the, the online learning tool and the position paper will be presented uh, at the end of 2019. But we can, I can give you some preliminary, pre preliminary findings. And um, well, the first is uh, uh, a recommendation to, to refer to widely accepted Bologna tools like the ECTS and the NQF and to define learning outcomes. The second is to ensure that information about course content and learning outcomes does not get, get lost in case of course updates or course ending. Uh, for instance, by using online badges where you can click on the badge to get more information or by using unique course codes. And um, a third one is to integrate e-learning um, both in internal and external quality assurance mechanisms. So this was uh, in, in very short what we've been doing and are doing in the Paradigms and Evaluate projects. The um, uh, Policy paper, Upsamook, you can find it on our website online. If you Google Upsamook, I think you will find it easily. And yes, I look forward to your to your questions and to further discussions. Katrin, thank you very much. Very, very interesting formal project mm -hmm. and we are looking for forward to see the results of this new one project. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, I, I was interesting to, to hear a little bit more about issue, how to ensure tr more transparency. Uh, in uh, e-learning uh, providers and uh, e-learning content. Uh, so can you just comment a little bit on, on that? Because I think that's a very, very important issue. Yes. Well, what we see is um, especially um, recognition of uh, e-learning, especially when you look at the MOOCs and the shorter models, it is often not the responsibility of one person at a university. It is, it is often uh, delegated to the faculties or even to the, uh, or to the course directors or even to the professors um, to, um, uh, to see if they can uh, uh, admit someone on the basis of those uh, courses or if they can give exemptions. So there, as a result, there are many, many, many people involved in uh, recognition of e-learning. But uh, they are often not aware of what it actually is and how to deal with it. So what we are doing in the tool is to give um, information o o about uh, um, what is currently happening in the field of e-learning, uh, what, what are important and provider providers, how does it work, how, how do they relate to the higher education institutions, um, and give a lot of examples just to, to raise awareness and to make sure make sure that people feel more confident about um, how they should deal with these qualifications or with Thank these you. certificates. Thank you very much. And now we are moving to our okay. last presentation. As you see, these presentations, just as uh, they were uh, ordered in this way uh, to be prepared because uh, each uh, presentation is opening the, the topic for the new one. And uh, this transparency model can be also said that it's kind of business model. So. Uh, the last uh, presentation is about business model for openness in Europe. And uh, Paul Bacic is with us. He's uh, uh, at the moment at the, the Matic Media and Zero Consulting, but he's also uh, a, a professor of practice at the University of West Indies, Open Campus, and visiting professor at the University of Derby Online, and lots of other roles. So uh, I think that uh, for the last, uh, not least, uh, uh, presenter, we have really person who has really vast experience uh, in education and online education. So, Paul, please share with us uh, your presentation and your views. Thank you. We cannot hear you, please. Uh, are, are Sorry, I, I was focusing on the slides. Can you hear everyone hear me now? Good afternoon, everybody. It's just past one o'clock in uh, in the UK. We're uh, ahead or behind. I can't remember which way it is. Um, anyway, let me start. Let me just make sure I've got control.
control of the slides. Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much um, for that um, good introduction. And I'm going to pick up on, on a number of points that Catherine and, and, and Morton have, have mentioned already. Because I think when you have the issue of a business model for openness, you have to know what, um, um, what openness is. I think knowing what a business model is is, is quite, uh, uh, quite subtle as well, but not in fact the fundamental problem. Just to give you some perspective, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting hearing the discussion about everyone referring back to e-learning as if there were some mysteries about e-learning. I mean, I have to say, and I'm kind of, Morton seems to be in the middle of my screen, so I'm looking at him particularly. Some of us get a little bit tired, perhaps because we're at a certain age. Um, here's a bit of historical perspective on, on, on distance learning. The UK Open University was founded in 1969. I think it was 30 years later that the first truly globally influential paper on quality in online learning came out, the famous Quality on the Line paper, uh, itself derived from work by Chickering and, and Gamson and, and, and Stephen Ehrman, who was a pioneer in this. Now that was, I think, 20 years ago. Since when, obviously in the US, they're very tired because there's a news item the other day, a uh, plaintive meeting of, of, of university uh, online providers, higher ed groups ask for flexibility with online learning rules. Now this may may say something about the Americans, I don't think it says anything about the current regime because this has really been uh, quite depressing for a while, but uh, why is it taking so long? How long do we have to wait for obvious things? Nothing is not new, e ECTS is certainly not new, What's going wrong? Now, it's easy to blame other people, but maybe we should think about blaming ourselves, and, and, and that might mean the e-learning community and the, OA, or the open education community in particular. But for those who want rapid progress to make OER and badges part of the system, um, you may have to wait longer, Catherine, than, than you thought. But I suspect you know you're going to have to wait longer than you thought. You just didn't want to say it. So come on to business models. Um, the beautiful thing about business models is it's quite a vague definition. It's not an Anglo-Saxon thing. It's not some kind of management school thing meant to frighten people. It doesn't actually, in that, uh, in any of these definitions, which are based on um, definitions from the Financial Times, I don't think money is actually mentioned as such. Um, the last one is a bit depressing to professors who now apparently are going to be called the factors of production rather than something more, more uplifting. Um, but I don't think we need to go into the details of business models. But one of the problems with business models is that people make a lot of uh, gratuitous distinctions because they come from a particular lobby. So someone said recently, and uh, there's probably a prize for um, the person who, who knows who said this, who said there is no difference between a MOOC-based degree and an online degree. No, it wasn't Tony Bates. No, it wasn't me. No, I don't think it was Morton. Um, because none of us went on to say, let's stop pretending these companies haven't pivoted away from MOOCs. So I think we have to basically um, uh, you know, reflect on some of the apparent distinctions that people make who come from particular um, fragments of the online learning space, which probably aren't really important, they're actually just confusing. Um, maybe I'll give the answer at the end if someone hasn't put it up on the text. Um, now, as, uh, as, as has been said already by more than one person, courses cost money, and Morton put it very eloquently. Norm normally, uh, Nordic people are supposed to be a bit reticent about mentioning money. It's a kind of Anglo-Saxon thing that, uh, that we do. But courses have to cost money, and money has to come from somewhere. Now, in, the, in, the, in Europe, we're lucky in many ways to have the European Union. Um, perhaps we'll see what happens when in England we don't have it soon, or maybe not. Uh, we're lucky to have governments with money some of the time. So you may have an earmarked grant, you may have a grant from the government based on some kind of formula. Uh, we may even in Europe have some foundations, but on the whole that's much more of an American thing. And many countries are regarding students as sources of money and increasingly. There aren't too many countries where fees are go currently going down. Um, Although, bizarrely, and most unlikely, uh, it, this may be happening in England quite soon, where fees may be cut. Um, let's wait and see. And, of course, uh, professors have great autonomy within their institutions, and so there may well be a lot of internal business models. 
but the problem is the problem is if you want to do a course it's just going to cost something even if it's just your time because it's t if you're a professor that's time you should should some would say be spending on research if you're not uh, doing these vanity courses so again I like a number of speakers I'm going to pose the the open issue as a, as a subset of the online issue now one of the problems in the EU widely and beyond the EU to nearby countries is there's not much of a business model for online because the kind of simple business model tends to rely on rich students paying high fees kind of a very attractive model obviously to the, to the UK and the Americans and to some extent the Australians and even the Irish some of the time um, but it's not it's not not commonly done and if uh, so I won't go into all the details because time is short but the point to make is down down the bottom uh, of, of, of the slides the last two points are quite important this kind of simple model of um, get the students to pay money for your course or even the slightly less simple model of get the students to take a course which will then motivate them to pay money for the next course you know sell the next course by making them getting them to take the first course apart from that all other business models are marginal now that doesn't mean they're not useful but it does mean if you're trying to make a business out of one particular business model then getting the money from the students is still a very attractive proposition um, now, or getting the money from the governments because you because you've got the students lots and lots of governments have numerous clauses and quotas and caps and in some countries um, not to be mentioned they're actually cutting the number of students they can have at the moment but let's not talk about these countries the other models uh, again models of civic role research funding grants and of course the famous sale of data model which has done Facebook very well for many years whether this is a long-term model will be an interesting um, thing to watch so let's come on to open now um, luckily for me and others uh, we spent a lot of time on this in various projects uh, most recently in the D transform project under Erasmus plus uh, I spent a lot of time personally on it for, for many years uh, and advising other people um, and the problem is that MOOCs and OER are usually outside providers' missions. And if you don't believe me, check the providers' missions. Check your own provider mission. Um, and as I say, the Anglo model of high fees market business model doesn't work well in most member states. People talk a lot about open textbooks, but the actual, um, the actual savings are quite small, and this is well documented. And they also tend to require teachers to be rather more managed and controlled than teachers are comfortable with or some countries if you have a national curriculum or a core curriculum or standards enforced rigidly then you can make the open textbook model work but that's not a common model in many member states and retention grades and sadly quality very sadly to some of us quality is not really a business model driver now one of my points today is that we we tend I think in higher education to look too narrowly and if only we looked next door to vocational education, TVET, uh, we'd find more interesting things. Now, again, I think time is short, so I'm not going to dwell on what what you can learn from the US and what you can not learn from the US. I'm sad to say many of my colleagues tend to, to learn the wrong things from the US. It's particularly dangerous to take any deductions from Silicon Valley. It is a very weird place with extremely uh, high-priced houses and a very mad kind of approach to to, to life and values so I really wouldn't um, you know I wouldn't take too much care with, with learning from them very there are a number of structural issues in California which make it very different from other other uh, from other other states in the US and from our member states but looking down the bottom of the slide there are things that we should pay attention to and on the whole in Europe sadly we don't close integration of the vocational sector with the HE sector I didn't mention I should have done uh, the uniform quality funding regime, uh, general importance to vocational skills, and systematize easy credit transfer, not waving your arms helplessly and saying, isn't ECTS wonderful and haven't we done well in Bologna? Yes, we have, but we've really only started, and that's one of the issues. So just to kind of make sure I've upset most people, I'll just mention that unlike... Um, Unlike many people in the States, competencies and outcomes are not actually new. Um, if they seem new to you, then maybe you should read, read a few more books. They're new in some jurisdictions, 
And they're new if your focus was purely on higher education. Because I've heard this phrase, oh, well, that's the kind of thing they do in TVET. P.S. So we'll not bother about that. Um, but luckily, many of the techniques uh, developed in TVET can be applied in, in HE also. And, and the point that um, Katrine made, uh, accreditation of prior learning really needs its own business model. And the honest answer is, if the student's not too valuable to the institution, or if the process of giving accreditation is lengthy, this, the institution will feel incredibly tired and the easy, the default answer is no in many institutions. Um, so you have to, we have to make APL uh, automatized. Now that this bottom is a side swipe really to, to, uh, to the US because, you know, MicroMasters, which I think people think is, is new. Well, I first heard the phrase modular masters in 1996, which is quite a long time ago, and probably it wasn't new then. So ECTS permits, uh, and Bologna permits, tiny numbers of credits. If, if you don't see them, that's because we in the universities haven't given them to you. We could. Now, again, there are many critiques of Bologna. Um, so if you want to read about that, look up the phrase Bane of Bologna, and you'll see, um, see what's going on. Now, this is an example of hopefully a very respectable course at TVET level four, which is kind of like after school and sort of very early in university, this in the vocational space. And you don't need to read this, but basically it has learning outcomes, it has assessment criteria, has suggested assessment methods. And this, you, I could have written this 10 years ago and had it accredited in, in the UK and in several other countries, but not all. And in fact, not many. Um, this kind of, you know, outcomes assessment model is very standard and used right through the vocational sector. And um, for tiny, this whole this whole course is ten is five ECTS, ten vocational credits. So quite a small course. And each unit of the course, separately assessable, is one vocational credit. Point five in ETC, ECTS. The vocational sector does not have a problem with this kind of thing. So why is higher education making life so difficult for itself? Maybe if it got a grip on this, we'd have a much more viable business model. So what to do and by whom? Now it's lovely to write recommendations and I was kind of looking over some of our colleagues' recommendations. And I think probably I first saw some of these in the lifelong learning reports of the 1990s. Um, and the trouble is that governments are very slow to react and there's a good report, slightly depressing report, written by myself and many colleagues, uh, funded by JRC, called Policies for Open Education in Europe, a survey of 28 member states. And there are some shining examples of member states who have got the message about open education, and then the rest haven't. And the trouble is, we widened the brief to make sure we looked at online learning as well. It really didn't help. And it really even didn't help to look at distance learning, because as some of the accreditors know, a number of member states are really quite, you know, careful about distance learning. That's a kind of polite way of putting it. But look, let's look at some some uh, recommendations. We need to take some kind of systems and financial viewpoint. We need to take the institutions as they are, not as we want them to be. And some of the recommendations have big downsides. Now, I think I've probably said enough about uh, things now. Another one I think is very relevant is, let's look outside the box, let's look to the box next door, let's look to schools, something that professors find incredibly difficult, believing that there would be something in high schools they could learn from, but there's a lot they can learn from. For example, it does help to have trained teachers rather than untrained professors. And so training teachers is absolutely important. However much we do, we won't do enough, we'll have to do it forever, we might as well get on with it. And I think that, that could be key because long term, that's probably one of the best ways of, of changing attitudes. And on that note, I'll leave the creditors with a little dilemma. What ISCAD level is your MOOC, mummy? Because that's the box that's normally not filled in on the form, as Catherine has already mentioned. So on that thought, um, that's all from me. Yeah. Good point. Good uh, what I'm saying is, why does it take so long? Why does it make take some change? Uh, I would say that outside, uh, I would say that outside changes 
integration and change in communication and recognition quite uh, faster than we. And I can, can I've been participating in some European Commission um, uh, policy uh, discussions, and uh, still couldn't tackle quite issue. Why? What is what is the issue? Why does it take so long for Europe to make some changes? I think just quickly, um, it's it's probably because it's Europe, and this is one of the, the strengths is one of the weaknesses. But I think also we tend to 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 make a development like with Bologna. We say, well, we've done that, and then we just sort of sit and relax. And instead of saying, well, that was a good start, why don't we do more? Somehow we kind of just relax. Uh, so, for example, the issues about ET, ECTS and study hours, there's a lot of excellent research suggesting the link between that and actual study hours is pretty vague, uh, to say the least. But we tend just to bury these reports. I think the other thing is, and it's well known among Commission officials, the, 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 the vocational side, uh, the vocational equivalent of, 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 uh, of Bologna has really not done at all well and you'll get people to admit that privately and I don't understand the reason for that. I think it probably says something about the variety of vocational schemes and I, I don't know what to do about that. Again I would say look outside. Why is it that across the world the t typical consultant advising UNESCO for example on TVET probably comes from Australia and if they don't come from Australia they come from New Zealand, they don't come from Europe uh, they don't come from the US or Canada because they don't actually even understand the concepts there, especially in Canada. So there's actually a, a mismatch between the OER world and the TVET world because TVET, TVET in Canada is fully devolved to institutions and that gives you nothing really to grasp on. So I think, I think we probably have to think smaller. Let's, talk, let's transform our institution or our country and maybe transforming Europe has to come a little bit later. Because it does seem to take far too long, I agree. Yeah, no, I, I, we would like, like to make, make to be sure that we are doing right before making another step uh, and very, very carefully we are doing that. Sometimes we have to jump uh, and to be a little bit uh, uh, not so careful uh, in order to achieve something. But uh, as we are coming to, to, to the end uh, of, of our session, um, there are some questions in the chat, so please look at them and if you can type uh, the, the answers. Uh, for the end, I would like to ask briefly, ask briefly from each of you, uh, in one sentence, uh, what would be uh, your next step for, for Europe uh, uh, raising issue on OER and open education? What should be the next, next step uh, uh, in that way? So from Irina, looking from the point of Eden, what should be Eden's next step in uh, approaching and uh, uh, recognizing and, and making more aware uh, OER? I still keep uh, to my position that we should work with the teachers who create uh, learning uh, uh, experiences for a student. Uh, in order that they search, find, integrate open educational resources and practices in education collaboratively, and then identify challenges that are put on the research agenda. Thank you, Irina. Martin, if you look from perspective of ICDE at the moment as the Secretary General, what is ICDE next move uh, in relation to OER? Oh, that was a tough one. Uh, obviously, we do work a lot with open educational research uh, uh, resources and uh, promote that. Uh, from my personal perspective, I think that uh, we now, with the technology we have, can develop and distribute a lot of good open educational resources. What is challenges is to have good people, good teachers to support and moderate and train and teach the individuals out there. And very often it is far too much one-to-one -to -one communication between one student and one teacher. 
And what I would like to see is more cost effective models on how we can use the teachers' workload more efficiently so that we can reach out to more people with the limited number of teachers we have. Thank you. Very good point. Svetlana from the UNESCO ITE perspective, what should be the challenges and next steps for OER? Um, currently, <clears throat> me and my colleagues, we are working in, in two directions. Um, one is uh, indicators for OER uh, impact, and another one is completely different, and this is open educational resources and artificial intelligence. This week is also the mobile learning week in Paris. Mm, but uh, well, if you would ask my personal opinion, I would say that uh, well, during this year that I've do, been dealing um, with open educational resources, I've, I've been thinking that there is a community of OER experts and the, there is a whole world of people who are unaware completely about open educational resources and well my idea uh, would be how uh, can OER uh, experts go beyond the OER community so that the OER would have a real impact on everyday Thank you. education. Thank you very much. Catherine from the your perspective of, of projects uh, that you have been doing and now you are planning are you thinking that this project you are doing at the moment is just the right one for, for at the moment for, for this direction? You you have to open the mic. You have my, muted the mic. Um, I think it is important to create more awareness about uh, recognition. I can hear myself. Yes, it's more. It's important to create more awareness about uh, recognition and. Um, First of all, for the recognition professionals, uh, develop guidance and support so that they know how to deal with these uh, uh, OER and recognition of OER, but also for um, uh, uh, providers of OER um, to, to take along uh, the perspective from recognition and what is needed if you want your course to be recognized. Sorry uh, for my voice and for my sneezing. I, I, I'm, I hope I will manage to to the end. And Paul, uh, the last one, uh, the last issue. Uh, what is going to do? Uh, what is the UK going to do? The EU, uh, how they will develop education? I think it, I find it very difficult to speak for the speak for the UK, especially at the moment. But what what I and some colleagues would like to do is to teach teach all the teachers in Europe to use open educational resources properly, but to do this in an accredited way. And let's have a go at accrediting uh, such a course, uh, which will be far smaller than a master's. Don't do that. A, a smallish, tight course, you know, 10 ECTS at most, and, and let's have it accredited uh, across Europe as a qualification. Now, we may have to work country by country, but if we start the process, maybe we, we can finish it. If we never start, uh, we won't finish. And as I say, we can provide some input on that. I think we just got to start it. But it has to be accredited, because otherwise people won't take it seriously. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Thank you. I think that in development and, and uh, in promotion after it's developed, so that all uh, all of us can uh, actually see that there is a in, uh, good example how to do things. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you for taking time today to all my speakers for being here and presenting their views and uh, opinions. Uh, definitely, we are coming from different parts of Europe and also outside the Europe. Uh, I've been looking at our participants. They have been coming from uh, all over the world. So it does only uh, confirm that uh, education is a global issue and it covers uh, uh, every, every country. 
and that the issue of open education is um, quite long present, but still a very, very important topic. And I would say that uh, the most important in this process are people. If we have educated and trained people who will know how to find open educational resources, who will know how to share these resources, how to reuse them as well, uh, how to communicate and share their experience, then, then we can move on and, and move further. So um, I think that we all agree that trained teachers, uh, uh, trained educators are well important. So um, thank you again for participating. Let me just remind you that tomorrow we start uh, again at uh, one, uh, uh, one city um, uh, from uh, on topic on, of open universities. Um, and also, uh, just to correct myself, on Thursday, the topic of OE uh, quality assessment is done together with uh, NAP, in the NAP and special interest group on uh, technology enhanced learning. And at the end, uh, I don't have my slide, but uh, I invite all of you to join us in Bruges in June for even uh, annual conference. Um, uh, there will be definitely again this topic, who will be who is still very much present and important. But we'll also talk about other issues. So join, be part of our community, and uh, if not uh, during this week. Let's be present together all in Bruges in June. Thank you very much all. Bye.